to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of Lord, and kings of king, king of kings, and those who are with Him are called. Friend, when you think about images of Jesus, I want you to think about His power, His majesty, and His victorious nature as seen in the book of Revelation. Let's think today in our study about more about Jesus, about Jesus in the book of Revelation. It's a totally different picture and one that I think you'll really be excited to see as we study together. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our Bible study. If you haven't got your Bible with you, uh, we want to give you time to find that, locate your Bible, get ready to use it as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ in your area, individual congregations and Christians in the Lord's Church. And friend, I assure you, members of the Lord's Church in your area would love for you, they'd be so excited for you to stop by and visit their assembly on Sunday or Wednesday for Bible study. You'd be an honored guest. And won't you look up their service time and visit the Church of Christ in your area? They'd be glad to have you stop by. You'll find people there who are friendly, loving, who, who want to serve God and who want to help others. And if you'd like to study the Bible, maybe you've got a question about what must I do to be saved or salvation, or maybe you've been out of church, but you're thinking about getting back into it. Friend, you'll find people there who'd be so happy to help you in your study of the Word of God and to help you ultimately to go to heaven. And that's what our goal is here at the Gospel of Christ. We're just simply a work, an evangelistic work of the Lord's Church, and we want to help you go to heaven. Our, our idea, our mindset, our goal is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and that world begins with you. If you've got a, a book you've been studying in the Bible, maybe you've been studying on a certain topic, and you'd like to know more about that, Go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got lessons on every book in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. We've got a, a large variety of topical lessons as well on nearly every subject you can imagine. They're all available to you free of charge from our website. You can request uh, our media also. You can go to our media request form. If you'd like to have a digital download of the lesson, we make that available as well as if you need a CD or a DVD. We'll even mail those to you free of charge. And so again, we're just glad you've joined us and we're excited about thinking about Jesus in the book of Revelation. Let's turn our attention to that idea. Images that you think about concerning Jesus that are very vivid are images like these. We see Jesus as a baby in the manger in Luke chapter 2 at His birth. We see Him in, in Luke chapter 4 and 5 where Jesus at a young, as a young individual is standing in the temple listening and asking questions of the teacher. We see Jesus as He goes about the cities in Galilee and as He heals the sick, as He feeds the poor, as He fed the 5,000. We see images of His ministry. And then of course, we see Jesus bound by evil men. We see them beat Him. We see them take Him up the hill to Golgotha. We see Him nailed to a cross, and, and we see the risen Savior return back to the Father. But today I want you to see some pictures of Jesus that we don't often think about. And these are found in the book of Revelation. I want you to see Jesus in the book of Revelation as, a, as His victory and His majesty and His power are put on full display to encourage and uplift Christians who are suffering that the one you're following is going to win in the end. And so when you think about the majesty and power of Christ, this is how the book of Revelation opens. What's the first image that we see of Jesus? You open to Revelation chapter 1. And, and turn there with me if you would. In Revelation chapter 1, we see this, this vision of the Son of Man. And you'll notice in verse 13, 
He's in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and hair like wool, white as snow, eyes like a flame of fire, feet like fine brass as if refined in a furnace, his voice like the sound of many waters, had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, uh, his countenance and his strength are like the shining of the sun. This so graphic image represents the Lord and Savior who we serve. And friend, it's put on display. The book of Revelation is signified. That is, it's written in signs and symbols that Christians could understand that at the same time could be gotten out that the Roman government wouldn't pressure them more for. But these images, and most of them come from the Old Testament, are such graphic depictions of the majesty of Christ. Think about it. He, he shines like wool, white as snow. God said in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Though your sins be like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. That, that picture is of purity. Uh, when you think about that two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, when you think about the Word of God, which is a powerful, soul-saving two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 verse 12. You, you think of that, his voice is like the sound of the many waters. You ever been by the ocean and just hear the crashing of the wave, just deafening in its power and authority? Friend, this is such a majestic, powerful, it's almost, um, it's almost done in such a way as to over-impress the senses with the majesty and power of Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus is. I can't begin to imagine His power, His majesty. And here's how this would help Christians. Some of these Christians, they're suffering at the hand of the Roman government. Some of them are going to lose their lives. And friend, today, Christians suffer. People lose their lives still today for becoming a child of God. What do I need to know? The Lord I serve is far greater in majesty, power. Everything about Him is supreme in every way. And if I follow Him, no matter what happens, if I follow Him, He's going to be victorious in the end, and so am I. And so initially we see Jesus with His majesty and power in chapter 1. In chapters 2 and 3. Jesus has those seven lampstands, the seven stars and the seven gold lampstands. And we learn that those are the seven congregations of the Lord's church in Asia Minor. And Jesus addresses everyone, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamum, Sardis, Laodicea. He addresses those seven congregations, Philadelphia, and He will encourage, He'll rebuke, He'll challenge them in every way. What do I see in Jesus in this picture? As he stands holding those seven stars and as he addresses those congregations, I'm reminded who the head of the church is. Friend, the head of the church is not located in some continent or place on this earth. Jesus is still the head of the church, right? Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Jesus is the head of the church, which is His body. God's Word is forever settled in heaven, Psalm 119, verse 89. And when Christ speaks, when God's inspired Word tells us what to do, that's what the church does. And so as I think about this idea, the church is the seven congregations in Asia Minor. Pressure is being put on them by the head of the Roman government, by Caesar himself. And some of them are beginning to think about Caesar's power and everything that's facing the church and the difficulty they're seeing. And, and the Lord intervenes in the midst of that and says, wait a minute now, it's not Caesar you need to worry about. I'm the head of the church. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to tell you what you need to do to be right with me. If you do these things, all else is going to be okay. And friend, that same lesson is so true for us today. Jesus Christ is still the head of the church. The Lord's church is not a headless, it is not decapitated like the headless horseman. The Lord's church still has a head. It's Jesus Christ. We need to follow Him, follow His will, and whatever we face, and who knows what that's going to be, whatever we face, if we read as Jesus writes these seven letters, these seven churches, and we think about ourselves and our congregations, and we try to make our lives right with God, whatever come, 
God's going to take care of His people because Jesus is still on the throne. Revelation chapter 5, chapter 4 and 5, we then see a, a rather graphic picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is not one that you initially think of when you think of Christ, but here He's seen as a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. I want you to look in Revelation chapter 5, and, and you'll notice verse 4. John wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll. This scroll is the unleashing of God's vengeance on evil people, or to look at it. Now watch this. But one of the elders said, Do not weep. Why? Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its soul, loose its scroll. And, and, and then you'll notice verse 6. He stood as a lamb though it had been slain. When you think of Jesus, He's both the, the lamb, He's the lion, and He's the lamb. You know, sometimes you'll see paintings or pictures of that, a lamb laying down with a lion, kind of the idea. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, most powerful animal in the jungle. Think about last time you went to the zoo and you're in the zoo and you hear the lion roar. You know what I think every time that happens? I think, I'm glad he's over there behind that cage and I'm over here. I would not want to be out on the tundra with that guy, right? He's as powerful as they come. But then the picture almost immediately changes. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah who can least un unleash God's scroll. He's the lamb, innocent, pure, docile, almost as though Helpless in some way, but he's not helpless. But he's the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. He have both the merging of his power and his sacrifice. You think of a lamb under the Old Testament, and lambs were a symbol of sacrifice. The lamb that was offered in Exodus 12, the Passover lamb, the multiple sacrifices and lambs throughout the book of Leviticus, the image of the lamb is that of sacrifice. And so his power and his sacrifice makes it possible for Him to unleash God's wrath, only because of what Jesus did can He unleash God's wrath on evil men. All right, Revelation chapter 6. Now we see a different picture of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and here He is seen as the avenger, the real avenger, the avenger of His saints. Look in Revelation chapter 6, and saints are suffering. God's children are being dealt a, a bad hand, and some are even dying at the hand of that. And look at Revelation chapter 6, and I want you to look beginning in verse number 9. When He opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now watch this. Then a white robe was given to each one of them, and it was said to them, they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were were completed. And then, of course, you have at the end of that chapter a picture of the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of His wrath has come. Who is able to stand? These Christians are facing things we can hardly begin to imagine. It's as though their lives have been a sacrifice under the altar and their prayers are a sweet-smelling aroma to God. And so they're crying out. Naturally, they're crying out, Oh, Lord God, how long, Lord, faithful and true, till you avenge us? And God takes that white robe. They're clothed with purity for the life they live. They're going to receive that exalted place. And God says, just wait a little while. I'm going to take care of that. And as you close chapter 6, you can see that, that lamb, the wrath of the lamb is released, and he is going to avenge God's children. And so when I think about Jesus, my responsibility I'm not the one who is to take that vengeance. I'm not the avenger. I'm not the one who is to do that. Romans chapter 12, God says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. There's a day coming. And this graphic picture of Jesus as the avenger of the saints clearly shows to the Roman government and to Christians today that no matter what we face, there's a day coming when God will avenge His people. All rights will be wronged. All troubles will be ended, all heartache and heartbreak will be dealt with, and those who have lived in and done ungodly things. Sadly, there will be a day of reckoning for that, but also 
for God's children, the clothing with white. There'll be a day of vindication for them and all that they've done and all that they could do for the cause of God and for the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We then see another picture of our Lord and Savior, and this is in Revelation chapter 11 and chapter 17. Here, here we now see Him as King of kings and Lord of lords, as the one who is going to win the battle over Rome and all evil governments because His purpose is greater than any other purpose. Look in Revelation chapter 11, and I want you to see the victory of His kingdom, and I want you to see the victory of the King Himself. Revelation 11, look in verse 15. Who's going to win? The Bible says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Now watch this. And He shall reign forever and ever. Is it, is it the Roman government we've got to worry about? Is that the, the kingdoms of this world today, the kingdom, kingdoms of this world, are conquered and consumed by the kingdom of Christ and His kingdom will reign forever and ever. God's purpose, His church, and His people are going to be victorious. Why? Because they follow the great King. Look in Revelation chapter 17, and then we'll notice what's said in Revelation chapter 19. Look in Revelation chapter 17. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says of those who are fighting against God's children and His church, these will make war with the Lamb. Now watch. And the Lamb will overcome them. Why? For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Look in Revelation 19, verse number 15 and 16. Now out of His mouth, this is a picture of Jesus, out of His mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it He should strike the nations. He Himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He Himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and He has on His robe and a name on His thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Friend, when you think about graphic pictures of Jesus, I want you to see His power as the greatest king, the greatest ruler to ever live on this world. You know, you can think of, you can think of great rulers upon the world uh, throughout time. You can think of Napoleon. You can think of the Caesars, not saying that all their lives are what they needed to be. You can think of great presidents in our time. You can think of great world leaders maybe right now. Of every king that's ever lived, of every lord who has ever existed, Jesus is King of those kings and Lord over those lords. What's that mean? You won't find anybody more powerful than Him. And because of that, His kingdom is going to outlast, outrule, and outreign every other kingdom. What is His kingdom? Jesus said His kingdom was His church. Mark 9, 1, Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. If I'm a member of that church and I'm following the King of kings and Lord of lords, I'm in the right place. The only place I need to be where safety and promise and providence is going to care for God's people. All right, let's then see another graphic picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation. We see Jesus in the book of Revelation as the way Satan is defeated. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 12 and you see the great battle that is unfolding. There's this picture of Satan. There's a great war that breaks out. He's trying to uh, prevent, thwart God's plan to save mankind. And notice in Revelation 12, I want you to see how Christians defeated Satan. Look in Revelation 12, verse number 11. The Bible says, and they, that's Christians, they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. See Jesus as the one who ultimately defeats the great enemy, Satan himself. That dragon of old, that great serpent, his army as though is making war, trying to make war with the armies of heaven. They're trying to thwart the Messiah and his plan. God's plan comes to fruition. Jesus is the one who ultimately defeats Satan, and through him we can do the same thing. Did you hear those words of verse 11? They... Christians overcame Satan in a threefold plan by the blood of the Lamb. What's that? Sacrifice. 
They overcame Satan through the sacrifice of Jesus. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. What's that? Scripture. What we have as the Word of God today. And they did not love their lives unto the death. Self-sacrifice. How do you overcome Satan? The sacrifice of Jesus, the Scripture, and a life of self-sacrifice is how you overcome Satan himself. And friend, I want you to see this glorious picture of Jesus and His great the, the armies of heaven versus the armies of hell and Christ as the captain of that army leading God's people in great victory because of His plan, His life, and His sacrifice. We have the joy and the hope of eternal life. Alright, here's another picture that is really beautiful. Revelation chapter 19. It's as though the drama is coming to a climax it's all winding down, and now we're going to see the glorious and victorious Christ presented over Rome and any evil government or evil force of that day. Look in Revelation chapter 19, and I want you to see how Christ is pictured so victoriously in this book. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Look beginning in verse number 11. The Bible says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it, sat on him was called faithful and true in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes were like a flame of fire on his head were many crowns he had a name written that no one knew except himself he was clothed in a robe dipped in blood his name is called the word of god the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Friend, if that isn't a, 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 such a graphic, beautiful scene of victory, I don't know what is. Here comes Jesus. Just imagine it. The gates of heaven are unleashed. Out of that gate comes a white stallion. Riding on that stallion is none other than Jesus Christ. He's robed in white. The armies of heaven who are also robed in white are following Him. He has that powerful sword which is the Word of God. He has a name written on Him, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He has a rod of iron to rule the nations. And He brings out, He reaps the winepress of God's wrath. It's unleashed on the nations. And Christ and the armies of heaven are victorious. And friend, that's the whole point. What in the world's that got to do with Christians and us today? To Christians who are suffering at the hand of the evil Roman government, God's message and revelation is, don't worry. It may be a little while. There are things that have to unfold. But Christ and the church and you are going to win in the end. Even if you lose your life, you're a winner in the end because you will be given that great crown of glory, Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. And to Christians today, in a world that is filled with so much evil, in a world where Satan's forces seem to be at work so much, isn't it good to know heaven, Christ, and God's people are going to win in the end? That, if we were to sum up the book of Revelation, that's what it is. Heaven, God, Christ, and the church wins in the end. There's no need to get downhearted. In the end, we're going to be the winners. Now we look to the final picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And this is such a, a powerful one as well. We now see Jesus as the great judge of all mankind for all time. Look in Revelation chapter 20, and I want you to notice what we see. Revelation chapter 20, there's now a throne. And look at what is said beginning in verse number 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Now watch this. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
that throne, the one sitting on it, everybody flee. His power is so much that people as though run in terror from that. And the whole world is judged. Books are opened. The book of life is opened. We're judged by the word of God, John 12, 48. We all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Romans 14, 12, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. We're judged according to the things we've done in this life. And friend, those whose names are in the book of life, meaning those who didn't give in, to sin and Satan, those who didn't cower in the face of the Roman government, those who may have even given their lives for Christ, those whose names were found written in the book of life. What a glorious day that was for them. Those who weren't, what a sad day that was for them. Friend, there are so many beautiful images of Jesus that we see in this magnificent book that show us His majesty, that show us His his sacrificial nature as the lamb who was slain, that show us his power as the one who's going to avenge Christians, the one who's going to lead God's army in victory, and the one who will ultimately judge all men. Now the question remains, in this great battle of good and evil, in the battle we fight, the fight we fight every day against Satan and sin, whose side are you on? The winning side's already been decided. Jesus, His church, and His people are going to be victorious. Whose side are you on? Are you on the winning side? If not, my friend, we encourage you to do that today. Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Acts 8, verse 36 through 38. Would you turn from a life of sin and repentance to God? Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And have every sin washed away and to get into Christ and to be on His side. Would you be immersed in water? Mark 16, 16, Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, 38. And friend, may each of us live in such a way that no matter what happens, we put our faith and our trust in Jesus and we strive every day to learn more about Him. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.